everybody. We start our uh, weekly colloquium, CFT colloquium. And today it is my pleasure to introduce um, our longtime friend and collaborator, uh, Professor Jan Ber from the University of uh, Arizona in uh, Tucson. Uh, Janek has worked, uh, Janek is a mathematical physicist who has worked on a uh, variety of, uh, of uh, problems and, and topics, but his main uh, broad area of research is the probability theory and various uh, applications of this probability theory in uh, physics. And today we are going to hear about one such uh, exciting uh, application um, uh, which has to do with nano robots as far as I understand or, or somewhere in the perspective at least. Okay, Janek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to talk here and it's a great pleasure to talk to an audience of physicists and it's always a little bit of a stress when you're a mathematician. So <clears throat> to relieve the stress let me tell you about the first time this happened at a real physics conference where I was a single mathematician and I was also introduced as a mathematical physicist and I wanted to explain a little bit what I'm doing and then it occurred to me that I may start from a cartoon of how real physicists see a mathematician. So here's what a mathematician does. <clears throat> I take a perfectly reasonable physics problem and I start simplifying it and modifying it until all the interesting physics is gone. <laughs> then I pull out my books on measure theory and all kinds of things like this, and I start working. And after two years, I prove the main result, which is that some important physical function, let's say free energy of the system or something like this, <clears throat> is Lebesgue measurable. And then my best PhD student works for another year and defends a dissertation where he proves that the function is not only Lebesgue measurable, but in fact also Borel measurable. And five years later, these are the fundamental results on the subject that everybody says are central. And people were laughing when I said that because I'm still quoting myself. <clears throat> and uh, when I saw them laughing, I said, I also have a similar cartoon about how mathematicians see physicists but I'll tell you that at lunch. <laughs> and similarly. Okay, so what I want to talk about is uh, exploration of a terrain, which is an inhomogeneous terrain. I'll explain what that means. It's going to be two dimensions. And uh, I'll have an explorer, and later I'll have several explorers. And they are going to move in that terrain according to the rules that I'll set in just a moment. Uh, let me first say uh, who are the principal people uh, working on that. Uh, not so much working with me as I was working with them because the main person in the whole project uh, is listed first here. It's Giovanni Volpe, currently uh, in Sweden and Gothenburg University. And the main idea and the most interesting effect I'll be talking about, mm -hmm. both experimentally and mathematically, uh, uh, is uh, the result of his uh, powerful intuition. Mita Mialkov was at that time his master's student. This was in Wilkent University uh, in uh, Turkey. Uh, and he uh, actually made the experiment. He's now working at the Karolinska Institute on brain research in Stockholm. Austin McDaniel was a PhD student in applied mathematics in the Tucson working with me and he's now doing quantum optics uh, for the U.S. Air Force uh, at, in Albuquerque. And there are several other people who are one way or another associated with this circle of ideas that I'll be talking about because this project that started several years ago is still pretty much alive. And I'll be talking perhaps towards the end about some new uh, results. But uh, uh, right at the beginning, I want to mention Tanner Rees, who is currently a graduate student in Tucson, who is exceptionally uh, good, and he already contributed to uh, the to several aspects uh, of the problem, despite being only a second year uh, graduate student. And uh, I think there's more coming from him. 
So the explorers that I'll be talking about, uh, first one explorer and then several of them, uh, are going to uh, react to changes in the environment with what's known as sensorial delay. All that means is that they are going to adapt their speed to where they are currently and how the terrain looks with a little bit of a delay, but there is a subtlety there. <clears throat> we'll be changing this delay parameter and the changes in the delay are going to change qualitatively the behavior of a single explorer and even more dramatically the collective behavior uh, of a swarm of explorers when we are going to set them free and let them move uh, around there. Uh, and this is the principal uh, idea, the principal uh, effect that I'll be talking about. And as I said, uh, it's verified experimentally as well as explained uh, theoretically. And the talk is a mix of <clears throat> mathematical ideas, stochastic differential equations, uh, something that with a certain amount of generosity you could call theoretical physics, uh, numerics, and experiments. Uh, so, um, far from being nanorobots that Jarek mentioned, although this is something that we have in mind, uh, these are mini robots, modestly, maybe two centimeters in diameter, something like this. So, not really miniaturized mm -hmm. uh, yet. Uh, and they are light sensitive, and I'll explain later how this light sensitivity uh, uh, enters the experiment. Uh, that was done with them. But let me first explain the theoretical framework of what we are uh, going to do. So we have a planar region that we denote by D, that's not very uh, important. And we have a scalar function on D, which represents the inhomogeneities of the terrain. The interpretation of this function is speed. So this function tells us how fast an explorer is going to move at a given point. It's a scalar function because this says nothing about the uh, direction. And let me uh, start from the preliminary equations of motion that we are going to modify later, hopefully modify in a way that will not do away with uh, all the interesting things. So you would just write these equations like this. Uh, dx by dt is equal to v times cosine of theta t, where theta represents the direction. Uh, in which uh, the explorer is moving, and same for the other coordinates. And now comes an essential point. We want theta not to be a deterministic function. We want it to be a realization of a random process. And this is not far from how uh, actual bacteria from time to time move when they want to explore a terrain, for example, looking for an interesting chemical they move around reorienting themselves in order to explore more parts of the terrain because if you just move in a straight line, you're not going to explore a lot. And uh, at least at first, if I have time, maybe we're going to make it a little more complicated later. Uh, I'm going to uh, make this angle theta uh, to be a rescaled Wiener process. Wiener process is what is typically in physics called Brownian motion, and I think it's somewhat unfortunate because uh, Brownian motion is really a physical phenomenon, and this is a mathematical construct. It's just a stochastic process, but it's often called a Brownian motion, and I think that everybody here probably knows uh, what uh, a mathematical Brownian motion is, but uh, uh, if you don't ask me, and in fact, ask me any questions that you feel like asking at any point. So, excuse me, this motion will be continuous or you will assume time steps which are fixed, like jumping? In mathematics, it's continuous. Uh, the actual reorientation of the robots is, of course, discrete. It has to be. So these robots, why robots? Because they are programmed to follow not exactly these equations, similar equations that you're going to see in just a moment. So what's the next step? The next step uh, is we want to rescale the speed as well, not just the uh, angle process. Because if you think about it for a moment, if the uh, explorer is changing the direction very rapidly, 
but the speed says, stays at the unit uh, magnitude, they're not going to move anywhere. Okay, so you need the rescaling that's uh, going to match the rescaling of the uh, angle process. And now comes the most important point. Uh, we are introducing sensorial delay. Sensorial delay is this little delta that's subtracted from the time parameter here. And what it says is that when an explorer gets to the point with a certain value V of the prescribed speed, it's going to take a little bit of time to change that speed, adjusting to uh, the reality uh, of the uh, terrain. And the question is, how is it going to scale with uh, epsilon? And I'm not going to take you through a calculation. You can either do a mathematical this function. This is arbitrary function, so there are some constraints on this function, probably, but yeah. reasonably constraints. Lebeck measurable, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, no, I mean, you're going to see we're going to differentiate this function in just yeah. a moment. It has to, has to be a reasonable function. Uh, so uh, there's a back of an envelope calculation that says that delta has to scale uh, proportionally to epsilon squared for a meaningful limit of the system uh, to exist. You can cook it up intuitively, or you can go through a longer mathematical derivation. I'm going to spare you this. And now, the idea is the following. I'm solving these equations, so I pretend that I have already solved them. I have a solution. This is the solution. I solved uh, the equations with some initial condition, and I'm asking, does the solution converge to something as epsilon goes to zero? The mode of convergence is going to be discussed on the other. Pardon me, I, I, I have a stupid question. So if there is a delay in time, uh, how do you specify initial conditions? Because if you put t for the than zero, well, you need an so initial I, condition a little bit back, further, push you back. further back. Yeah. Ah, so you just uh, delay that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> no, no, this is all, all well defined. But don't worry, we are not going to be solving these equations because they are too hard. Anyway, uh, so uh, we'll get rid of this delay by a dirty trick in just a moment. Delta will stay in the equations, but not in this place, OK? And so the idea is solve for every epsilon and then try to take the limit in some sense as epsilon goes to 0. That's, that's the project. Why should it go to 0? Because we want a limit in which things are changing fast and moving fast. What this really is saying is I want to work at, uh, on the regime in which this is happening. And if I can prove uh, convergence here, then I can ask if my real physical system that's studied in the lab is already close to that limit. Of course, ultimately, the experiment has to decide. The question is convergence and not the, the value of the limit itself, right? No. Because if it doesn't converge, then if it doesn't, doesn't converge, then, sense, right? then, then we are not doing anything reasonable. To rescaling in this way means is equivalent to rescale the time lapse. Of you, course. You, could, you, you could think about it this way, but uh, uh, if you're doing an actual experiment in the lab, what you're thinking of is things are moving fast and you're hoping that they're moving fast enough to be close to that limit if it exists, as Lashley says. Okay. So uh, here's the dirty trick that I mentioned. Uh, instead of uh, considering this beautiful system of equations, which is unfortunately uh, way too hard to study. I mean, there's nothing that mathematicians can really do with this. Uh, we are going to linearize and actually double linearize because we will be linearizing the functions x and y as functions of time. And then we'll be linearizing the function v also. And remembering that delta is proportional to, uh, that is equal to C epsilon squared, by all these linearizations that are totally unjustified, we're not controlling the errors or anything like this. We are just doing this and trying to see what happens. Plus another approximation that I'm going to sweep under a drug, we arrive at a system of equations, which looks like this. So there's no delta anymore because 
delta equal to c times epsilon squared was substituted, and this is how the system looks now. And this is much more decent because this is written already in the format, uh, which is familiar from stochastic differential equation uh, theory, where we use differentials rather than derivatives. So uh, you have differentials of three variables that enter the system, x, y, and theta, which is now treated as a dynamical variable of uh, the uh, problem. And on the right-hand side, you have various functions of these three variables multiplying dt in most cases. And in one case, you actually have the differential of the Wiener process. And this is the noise source in the whole uh, random uh, system. And there's only one noise source. There's only one Wiener process that enters this system of three equations. I'm stressing this because in just a moment, we are going to see two noise sources. And there will be a question where they are coming from. But for now, this is what we have. OK, so this is already manageable or more manageable. At least there is a hope of taking the limit of epsilon going to 0 and trying to ask, what do solutions converge to? I still didn't tell you in what way they are supposed to converge. And I'm going to say this in just a moment after a short plug from the theory of stochastic differential equations. So what I'm going to do now is say in few words about how you deal with general systems of stochastic differential equations, which look like this, uh, and uh, how you can use the method that I'm going to outline in order to study the limit of the solutions, in particular of an equation like this, but in much greater generality. Any questions thus far? Can you choose the uh, order of epsilon? Like, uh, for example, you delta, you choose your second order of uh, epsilon, and you that's your own choice, or? Some... Well, uh, let, let me answer this like this. You could try to scale delta with epsilon in any way you want, and the only meaningful limit you're going to obtain will be for the scaling that I chose. Okay, it's, this is how we first saw it. Then later, once you see it, you can ask why this is true. Why is this a relevant time scale? And you can think about this by seeing what happens if you change the angle by a certain amount and how it influences the motion. And you see that it's a natural scale. Okay, so this is the general. SDE, stochastic differential equation system. And in this case, it's driven actually by several noise sources, which are independent Wiener processes. And you have M equations, one for each component of the process. That's the solution of the uh, system. And it all looks like this. And you can convince yourself that this is a very special case of this general framework. And we have coefficient b, which are called the drift coefficients, and coefficient sigma, which are the noise coefficients. And from the sigma coefficients, we build a matrix, which essentially is sigma matrix sigma multiplied by its transpose, if you look at it. Only I am here summing explicitly over the noise sources alpha because, uh, OK, because I prefer to write uh, things this way. And then once I have the uh, uh, coefficients A, together with the coefficients B that were already present in the system, I'm building a differential operator, a second order linear differential operator. This is how it looks. It has, uh, here are the shorthand notations for the derivatives that are probably self-explanatory. Sorry, I forgot about this sum, so I inserted it late. Uh, this is the first order part, the advection operator, and this is the second order part. This matrix A, as we have said, is sigma sigma transpose, so it's positive or non-negative definite. You have parabolic second order differential operator associated with the SDE system. Out of the blue, but not for physicists, because physicists know, know very well, that once you have a stochastic differential equation system, this is the first thing you do. Only typically, they associate a slightly different operator. We'll talk about this in uh, just a moment. But that's what we did. We said, SDE, I don't want to deal with the SDE. Instead, I want to do a partial differential equations theory. So there is a PDE, or a partial differential operator, associated with the SDE. 
And now, if I want to study the asymptotic behavior of solutions of my system, I'll do it at the level of the associated PDE. So I don't do it directly. I take the operator, which is related to this system, the way it was explained here. And I study this operator in the limit of epsilon going to zero. And then I'll go back to the SDE picture when I'm done. And uh, this is how it looks. Uh, I obtain the operator L, which is written here. Never mind the details for now. We are going to go back to that uh, later, trying to see what various parts of these operators do, what, what is the role that they play. But here is the main theorem that expresses what I said earlier. If you want to know where the solutions converge to, you study the convergence of the generators. So these operators, L epsilon, in what sense? What sense of convergence? Uh, well, the uh, generators converge to a limiting generator if the condition listed in this theorem is satisfied, if you can find for any f approximating functions of epsilon such that you have these two convergences. I'm sweeping a lot of things under a rug here. The domain issues for these operators, which are differential operators, therefore not defined for on the, on the whole Hilbert space of any kind. This is completely neglected here. Also, I'm not talking about the mode of convergence uh, here. What does it mean for functions to converge? This is the general theory of um, Markov semi-groups, and you can find it in books on probability theory. That's not the main thing that I would like to focus on. Although, if you want to write a math paper on that, oh, by the way, uh, there is actually now a paper on archives that finally makes these things that we earlier did in a non-rigorous way, rigorously, in a, in a mathematical way. You can find this, and uh, the way to do this is to put uh, the name of Tanner Rees that I mentioned earlier, uh, and myself, uh, and my name uh, into archive, and then uh, you'll find it. So this is, this is what we uh, use. And now what does the theorem say? If you have the convergence of generators in the way that's indicated here, then the law of the process that solves the system with the value epsilon of the parameter converges to the law of the process with the generator. And what does the law mean? This is a mathematician's way of saying the joint distribution of all the paths of the process, because we are solving a stochastic differential equation. That means there is a random input. That means that the solution of an SDE is not a function, it's a random function. It's a stochastic process. A stochastic process has a distribution, but this time it's a distribution on the space of paths of the realizations of functions. And this is called the law in probability theory. So the theorem we are using is the generators of processes converge, converge the laws of the associated stochastic processes converge. This is called weak convergence in mathematics. And notice that we are not talking about what happens for a particular realization of the noise. We are only talking about the global distribution, joint distribution of the paths of the uh, process. This is important uh, in view of what we are going uh, to see uh, in just a moment. And what we are going to do, yes. Uh, uh, by knowing here some kind of condition of probability of the system that we are feeling it was at. at no, time. no, I mean the probability distribution on the space of paths. It's a phase average, right? No time average. No, no, and nothing is average over time. Uh, pardon, yes, if you want to use the blackboard, then there is one behind you. Okay, fine. If I need to, I will. Thank you very much for now. It's ergodic, but not uh, a mixing process. There is no time limit. Uh, there is no uh, ergodicity assumed here. In just a moment, we will be talking about it. Uh, but uh, for this general theory, you don't need any ergodicity or mixing uh, uh, at all. This is just the theory of stochastic differential equations. You have an equation. There's a Markov process associated with it, ergodic or not. There is a generator. And so this way, everything gets translated into functional analysis. For a moment, 
because you, instead of the Markov process, you're considering a semi-group of operators in the Banach space. Okay. That's really the mathematical vehicle of what we are doing. I mean, uh, naively, this uh, L epsilon uh, operator has a singular limit, right? It if does. Epsilon goes to zero. This so is singular perturbation. Imagine that L epsilon times F epsilon, acting on F epsilon, converges epsilon goes to zero on something small. But uh, what is then the generator L? It's actually a decent uh, differential operator you're going to see in just a moment. So yeah, I know it looks a little bit surprising, right? Because there is one over two epsilon squared here. But if you adjust this epsilon in a particular way, this is in fact going to happen. Okay, this is really one way of looking at this is singular perturbation theory. It's not fully rigorous. This is how we did it first before we harnessed the existing theory of Markov processes. But uh, you can you can do, uh, do it this way. Okay. So this is the scheme of what we are doing, which perhaps makes uh, it uh, more uh, natural. We have this SDE that we want to study the limit of, because it depends on epsilon, we want to take this epsilon to zero. We don't do it directly. We pass to the associated differential operator. We take the limit at the level of the operators. We obtain the limiting operator. L, and then from this operator, we recover, reconstruct, the limiting equation, and you are going to see it in just a moment. Okay? Uh, here's a remark for those of you who are familiar uh, with the fusion theory, the physics style, which probably means all of you. Uh, in physics, uh, you associate with random dynamics, with stochastic dynamics, an operator, a differential operator, which is called the Fokker Planck operator. And uh, in mathematics, we call it the, back, the forward Kolmogorov operator. The difference between uh, what uh, the forward Kolmogorov operator is and what I did is essentially taking the dual operator. It was Kolmogorov who understood, knowing the work of the physicists, which was, of course, earlier, Smoluchowski, Einstein, then Kramers, Popper, Planck, and so on, uh, that backward operators were more manageable analytically, and uh, that's what we use this. In fact, the whole calculation that I'm presenting here could have been done at the level of the Fokker Planck uh, uh, operators as well. It would be a little more complicated, but uh, it would definitely be a legitimate approach. And if you carry all this out, and I'll save you the calculations, you get the limiting system whose law represents the limiting joint distribution on the space of paths, and this is how it looks. And this is the first surprise, because uh, where the system before was driven by a single noise source, now we have obtained a system that is driven by two independent noise sources, W1 and W2. This is what uh, the procedure of recovering an SDE from a differential operator takes you to. And it's a one-to-one -one operation. You have no choice in the matter. So now, after taking epsilon to zero, we obtain a system that's driven by two independent noise sources. How come? Well, we're going to explain this a little bit. But for a long time, I didn't really understand this. Um, there's no contradiction because precisely we are taking the weak limit. We are only after the limit of the distribution on the space uh, of paths. But nevertheless, one would like to know how something resembling these two independent noise sources comes about in the limit. How are they born or created from a single Wiener process WT? Or how do you split the single Wiener process WT so that you get two? In the limit, we are going to see how that uh, happens. So actually, uh, I was giving a related talk at some point uh, at a mixed math physics uh, conference. And a French physicist, Denis Bernard, uh, walked up to me after my talk. And he said, I know what happens here, because I encountered a similar phenomenon in a work on quantum optics, totally unrelated. 
to that. What happens is you take a single Wiener across this W, you do this to it, you combine the values of the Wiener crosses this way, and you obtain in the limit, again, in distribution, in law, a two-dimensional Wiener process. The two components become, in the limit, independent. And uh, uh, I thought, oh, okay, if that's the case, there must be a theorem to that effect. I looked for it and I couldn't find it. So I called uh, a very well-known mathematician who is Mr. Wiener process. If there is something about the Wiener process that people know, he knows it. And I said, is this true? And after a couple of days, I got the response. And he said, it's probably true, but I've never seen it. Uh, it took me a while to realize that there are theorems in probability theory from which you can derive this by appropriately changing the variables and rescaling things and so on. Uh, actually, uh, closely related to what Professor Kiosk uh, said earlier, rescaling of time, you can obtain this fact but it's never written in any math source that I would be aware of in this uh, uh, fashion. <clears throat> so so uh, uh, this surprise, once we figured this out, became uh, a source, and this is a sort of mathematical uh, aside, uh, of a far-reaching generalization. We wanted to know if you could uh, produce more than two independent binary processes from a single binary process by combining uh, the values of the binary process in some other way. Can you obtain an arbitrary number of binary processes? And with Tanneries, we proved a theorem, uh, which is indicated here. I do not want to uh, go into all the details because the formulae get a little uh, complicated. But instead of cosine and sine, you can actually use periodic functions uh, which satisfy the condition that their mean over the period uh, is equal to zero. And you can consider um, a much more general system of equations, which is here uh, written in a vector form. So x can have an arbitrary number of components, uh, you can look at the uh, system of this form and take its limit, sending epsilon to zero, and obtain uh, a limit again, which is driven by uh, as many linear processes uh, as you want, as many as, oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, this is not what I wanted to do. Uh, as many as the uh, number of uh, the terms uh, in this sum. So indeed, you can split a Wiener process into an arbitrary number of independent Wiener processes, uh, as long as you do this uh, in distribution. Was they orthogonal or whatever? They're independent. So in probability theory, uh, independence is stronger than orthogonality. They are orthogonal, but they are more than orthogonal. OK? Because orthogonal is uncorrelated. That's really all there is to it. Independent is much more than this. But this function is by alpha. Yes. So how many of them? So alpha, what is the number of this process? Any, it's an arbitrary number. Arbitrary, arbitrary number. You can obtain as many independent noise sources from a single noise source as you want. Sure. Why is the periodic and average is zero? Yes. 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 And, and, and there is no condition like uh, Victor was mentioning, there is no uh, necessary condition that uh, phi alpha should be sort of like say or someone else could return alpha. Well, okay. Uh, if you do that, you obtain a simpler form of the limiting equation. But if you don't assume this, you will have a little bit of uh, a linear combination entering in the final equations. So th then you have a choice. You can either write this in terms of independent linear processes, or you can combine them linearly, and they are no longer independent. But in the background, you have the number of nice sources that's dictated by the number of alpha in uh, this sum. So it's an interesting mathematical result. At the moment, it's not applied to anything in physics, but I think we put it on the shelf because one day it may be useful uh, here. We wanted to figure out 
whether there was anything really special about cosine and sine, because the first proof that I had of this theorem that's listed here was heavily using the fact that these were cosines and sines and not something else. So now we know better and we can do it sort of, Yes. Is there some indication that you can do it like in reverse? You have a bunch of independent linear processes and you can recognize that you can do Combine again. That, 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 that's a very interesting question that at the moment I don't have a very good answer uh, to. But remember that what's happening here is that there is a limit taken in distribution. So it's not exactly producing linear processes from a single linear process <laughs> until you send epsilon to zero and you take the distribution of yeah. Okay. Back to our explorer. So that's that was the general SDE aside, but we are dealing with the single explorer that's moving uh, in our inhomogeneous uh, in, uh, region. And so far, I didn't have a chance to write this limiting generator that Leszek was asking about. How come this L, L epsilon converges to anything that looks reasonable? Well, here it is. This is how it looks. It's a very nice. Uh, second order differential operator written here with Laplacians and gradients. Uh, and uh, if you take uh, its adjoint, essentially integrating by parts, then you obtain the Fokker Planck, the corresponding forward Kolmogorov or Fokker Planck operator. And what it's good for is that when you solve the stationary Fokker Planck equation, when you equate the value of the Fokker Planck. Uh, operator on a function g to zero, you obtain, if you can solve it, uh, you obtain a density of the stationary probability distribution. This was uh, goes back to your question. There is actually a stationary distribution here, uh, limiting distribution, and in this case, uh, the processes are ergodic. You get an equilibrium distribution, so you get. Uh, um, detailed balance condition. I'm not going to use any of this, but just for uh, your information, this is a nice stochastic process. And you can solve the equation. And the equation solves like this. V, let me remind you, was the speed function that was defining the model K is just a normalizing constant. So this is a probability density. And C was this parameter that was entering the formula for the delay. Delta equals C times epsilon squared. Nice compact formula for G equal uh, for, for the density of the stationary distribution. Now, a big secret of all this project was when we linearized the equations, let me go back and show you the linearized equations again, when we used all these approximations to write them, the way that C now enters, this is the only trace left of the delay that we introduced into the original equations. <clears throat> the way that C enters is such that we can put it positive or negative, and the equations are fine. Everything is well defined. Now, this is how Giovanni actually programmed his robots. You can change the parameter C, and they follow these equations. So we made an approximation, and then we made the robots follow the approximate equations. We're allowed to do that. This is a man-made system. And therefore, this is not such a wild approximation that it may seem, because it actually corresponds pretty well to what the robots are doing. And what we gain from this is that we can put C equal to a positive number or a negative number. And again, this is not so far away from what bacteria are doing, because when a bacteria are moving towards a source uh, of a chemical that they like in chemotaxis uh, process, they're actually trying to measure the gradient of this chemical and move towards the place where there is more of the good stuff. So in a way, they're predicting the future. They are saying, if I'm going to move in this direction, I'm going to encounter more of what I want to uh, encounter. We are going to see how dramatic is the effect of this for our system, uh, expressed by the stationary density. Because what stationary density tells you is 
where the explorer is spending most of its time. And let's first look at the natural case where the delay is positive. So you look into the path. And let's ask what happens when uh, C is a positive number. So explorer spends more time. Where it moves more slowly, this formula tells you that because this is a negative exponent. So where B is bigger, this number is smaller, and this number expresses the, is proportional to the amount of time, average amount of time, uh, that the explorer is spending uh, at uh, this point. This is not a big surprise. Everybody could figure this out, right? Because if you're moving faster, then you're getting away from that point very quickly and you're no longer there. Now, uh, in fact, you can make C even bigger than minus two, even if it's negative, and you will have the same tendency as long as this exponent one plus C over two, before you take the minus sign, is positive. Only the effect is becoming weaker as C is approaching minus two from above. And that's perhaps less intuitive. It's not so easy to figure out intuitively, but still very natural. But this qualitative, but, but this uh, way of this behavior is changing in a qualitative way when C is less than minus two, which is for our equations, a perfectly legitimate value. You can program the robots to move that way. And then you have a very counterintuitive effect that says the explorer is spending more time where it's moving faster, not slower. So it means that you have to predict uh, your future with some large delay. Okay, this is not yes. delay. Yes. Yes. Well, to, it, it, it takes some... large is of course a relative. Okay. So, but if it is very small, so you do not. Gain no. Anything. No. No. So it's not when you cross zero. zero. It's when okay. you cross yeah. minus. One of the most satisfying moments in this whole project was when I calculated that, and I went to the experimental people. And I said, everything seems to work, only I have this strange effect that at minus two, things start to change in a very weird, weird way, wild way. And they said, that's exactly what we see in the experiment. Okay. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that when you work with experimental people and do something like we did things honestly, we, I, I wasn't trying to get what they were already getting, I didn't know what they were. So, and this brings me to intended or envisioned. Uh, pardon, Yannick, so what is, like, so what is the explanation? Why, uh, so uh, negative delay is, of course, not a delay, but uh, advanced. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what, is, what is the explanation for this strange behavior? You do, the, you do the math, and it comes out of the math. Okay. So what, what kind of behavior is it? What is strange? So what is strange is that you're spending more time where you're moving faster. It would seem that if you're moving faster, you should be getting away from that uh, point, but that's not what's happening. Yes. But is it, is it also correlated with the very fast change of the direction? So if you move fast, but, fast. If, you, but fast. if you change the direction fast, then basically you can imagine staying in a faster well, future. Sure. So I'm, I'm not against explaining this in a in an intuitive way. In fact, I would very much welcome such an explanation, but I don't have a very good uh, explanation to well, offer I other than the fact... It's quite clear because then you move very fast, but you change the direction, so in, 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 uh, you do not leave this, uh, this space. Yeah, but this argument would apply to any value of C positive or negative. Correct. It must be some kind of a correlation between the speed and the speed of changing the direction. Yeah, but so I buy all, all intuitive explanations as long as they take into account the fact that the behavior is dramatically different for C greater than minus two and less than minus two. But intuitive explanations that say, oh, it's kind of natural that do not differentiate between these two regimes don't really satisfy me because they don't show why there should be a qualitative transition between these two regimes. That's something that you have to somehow take into account. 
So uh, here are some intended or envisioned applications. You are controlling a bunch of these explorers from the outside, changing the parameters of the system. And, uh, and uh, when you do that, you can, uh, ah, I should say first, uh, what uh, uh, happens if you have more explorers uh, than one, and that's probably the last thing that I'm going to say because I think a lot of time I'll say for the other two days for uh, uh, a private discussion. So now imagine the situation um, where you have several light sensitive robots which also emit light. And the way that the speed function comes about is it depends on the light that the robot sees. You can do it for a single robot as well by creating a certain stationary light field and you can make it move faster when there is less light away from the light source. And this is actually how the experiment for a single robot was done. If you have several light sensitive robots, then they create the light field for one another and of course, this is a sort of mean field way of thinking because the light field is no longer stationary. It changes in time. But you expect a similar effect that we have seen for a single robot to occur for a number of robots. And then what does it mean uh, that you want to spend more time where you're moving slower? It means that you want to be closer to the other robots because you want to see more light than they emit. And the robots, as a group will aggregate them. What does it mean for them to like spending more time when they're moving faster? It means that they want to de-aggregate. And you expect a transition in this behavior to occur at c equal to minus two, and that's exactly what you see in the experiments. Now, if you go uh, to the intended applications, you have a bunch of explorers, you control them from the outside, and then by changing the parameter C, you can change their behavior from aggregation to the aggregation at will. And this is a, certainly a potential uh, application in search and rescue missions when you want a bunch of explorers to somehow seek uh, the objects or people that they want to recover or uh, uh, rescue, and then you want them to all congregate at a single place. What actually motivated Giovanni Volpe when he started uh, this project and invited, invited me to join it was thinking about uh, potential medical applications, uh, which are talked about in biomed engineering, where a swarm of micro robots, these would be probably the nano robots that. Uh, Jarek is talking about enter human body and they can't all travel the same path because they are going to destroy the tissue but if they travel separate paths and then you have a way of making them aggregate at the desired point then they can be of uh, some use this is this has not been realized it, it will be realized it won't be by us we are not biomed engineers this was the motivation and uh, that uh, we had at the time. And I think my time is up. I have several other things that I could talk about, but uh, probably. Well, you can, maybe, yeah, because there were quite a lot of questions and interruptions. So let's say uh, five more minutes, if that's okay. Sure, I'll just flash a couple of things that I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, so, first of all, um, let me stress again that what I talked about so far uh, was very thoroughly uh, checked experimentally, but the part uh, about the group behavior of uh, several robots uh, was uh, only so far done with very few of them. There is now a project underway where we are going to have a few hundred. But since each robot has to be reprogrammed and they are used for many different projects, uh, reprogramming 500 of them takes about a year and uh, the experiment is still waiting to be done it will be performed in uh, Gothenburg perhaps this fall uh, I'm trusting in the meantime uh, there was an expansion there was a, a more general system in which the uh, rotational diffusion the rate at which the direction changes 
was also position dependent, the calculation was more complicated, and there were no phenomena uh, because the system was no longer having equilibrium steady states. There was no detailed balance. You actually see, can see a current uh, in the system, uh, and the calculations are harder. Finding the uh, density of the stationary state is no longer typically possible in a, a closed form. Two uh, students of Giovanni in Gothenburg uh, performed uh, the experiment. Very interestingly, similar equations to the equations that we are studying come up in a totally different situation. Uh, in experiments uh, or mathematical analysis of experiments related to the so-called motility-induced phase separation. This is a phenomenon you see in bacterial colonies. You have a colony of bacteria, and in certain situations, they spontaneously form islands of greater density. And one wants to understand what's happening there. The bacteria are moving. There is a mathematical model. If you look at the equations, I'm not going to go into details. They are very similar to what we had, but there are some uh, different uh, details. And what we can uh, do is predict the critical value of K uh, and uh, some other features of the formation of the islands um, in a way that agrees uh, with the experiment. And in fact, with some fine details of the experiments, there are some exponential small correction uh, to uh, naive formula that we can also get from this formalism. Essentially, SDE theory, Fokker-Planck, uh, and uh, all this does the job. Three dimensions is also possible. Random changes of direction then require a two-dimensional linear process on a sphere. And these are equations describing such. And so we no longer have a simple one over epsilon dWt, but you have to do this and multiply by one over epsilon. Austin McDaniel mentioned on the first page did all the calculations in this three-dimensional case. And uh, we have, again, an aggregation, the aggregation transition uh, there. And finally, something that's very close to my heart these days is I want to get away from the white noise approximation. White noise means when you integrate it, you get the Wiener process. Our Wiener process is the integral of the white noise. That's, of course, a very questionable statement. This doesn't exist other than distributionally. Let's forget about all this. White noise means the increments of the angle process are totally uncorrelated. I want them correlated because that's the physical reality most of the uh, time. And the simplest case uh, is the einstein ullenbeck process. And I can repeat all the analysis, which is much more complicated than uh, for this case and calculate uh, the limiting coefficients, coefficients of the limiting equation explicitly. In fact, I can uh, study a much more uh, general noise, which is defined by a Langevin equation. A linear function P here would correspond to the einstein lembeck case, uh, but uh, pretty much arbitrary function P satisfying some conditions, of course, uh, uh, would do. And then, interestingly, the coefficients of the limiting equation are characterized in terms of an auxiliary Schrodinger operator. This is just a mathematical association because, uh, of course, there's nothing quantum about this process. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> so let's open the discussion and uh, questions. Mark was first. So two things. So maybe I missed something. But what is the role of the uh, many in this robots? With, because there is no apparent interaction. There is an interaction mediated by the light field that they create. So, so the the last, uh, sorry, the speed is dictated by the local intensity of the light. If you now have several robots that shine light on each other, then depending on what the other robots are doing, I see more light or less light, and accordingly, I'm moving faster or slower. So that's so, the way they So, so this leads me to the second question. Could you say a few words about how this real experiment is done? So what is it? Yeah, so for, uh, let, let me start from a single robot. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. okay? You actually uh, have a stationary light source. And this is the road. So the light is the light field is radially symmetric now, mm -hmm. and uh, the robot sees more light when it's closer to the source and less light when it's uh, further away. <clears throat> so this is the function v of x y is now radially symmetric in this experiment. It doesn't have to be; you can organize it in a different way. But in the simplest experiment, that's the way it's done. Okay, and so it's then following the equations that uh, we wrote, and then uh, we are doing the statistics of the time that the robot spends at any given uh, position. And what we are seeing is an approximation to the function g that we obtained uh, earlier from solving the Fokker-Planck equation. And what we are seeing is that depending on the value of the delay, this g is following the formula. Well, it's always following the formula that g is equal to k times v to the power minus one plus c over two, but the qualitative uh, behavior of this function is very different depending on the. And these robots are some mechanical devices. They are mechanical devices, uh, something like I can't remember two, three centimeters sensitive. across, sensitive. and they are light sensitive, which makes them adapt their speed. Yeah to the local light in the intensity with the desired delay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, uh, pardon, uh, Victor? <laughs> I, I just wanted exactly to ask about the distribution. So it's a function of V and should be normalizable. If the exponent is positive, when, when the C cross, then you cannot integrate. Well, we are in a limited region. We're in a bounded region, and experimentally, of course, we have to be, right? I mean, uh, certain area where they are moving. But this exponential looks like an you know, eigenvalue of some Markov process of operator. You, and then, uh, this is Markov process, of my understanding. And then, stationary uh, uh, distribution is obtained as a yeah, unit. But right, but but well, you essentially had this operator, right? Uh, uh, here, this is the equation you're solving. This is how this density comes about. And so uh, you're looking at the lowest eigenvalue of the generator of the Markov process. You're absolutely so what happened on the boundary? Well, yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> We neglected the boundary. <laughs> okay. Uh, Piotr, You're right. That's a good question. Maybe a silly question, but uh, what, what is the reason not to just simulate those robots? Oh, we did that. I, I forgot to mention this. We actually did. Well, we is an overstatement. Uh, my collaborators did extensive numerical simulations with, uh, I think, as many as a thousand. Uh, explorers, and they saw very clearly this aggregation, deaggregation uh, phenomenon. Yeah, I, I, I should have said this. Okay, Nicole, please. So, question, question number one What happens exactly at C equal to minus two? Is there anything interesting or just there is? There is just it's very hard to hit experimentally C equal to minus two, but what's uh, w you don't see anything very interesting because there is no very obvious aggregation, nor is there very obvious deaggregation. That's the transition point. Yeah. Um, and the second question, is it possible to consider a kind of one-dimensional analog of that? Or it switch be that the robots could switch just the direction over one line? Hardly, because these are material uh, agents, and they could not really go through one another. So I think that some very limited version is perhaps uh, just one of them, probably. Yeah, I think. Which is not so interesting, which is not so interesting because uh, there is no this application, yeah. the application transition. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's percolation. Okay, uh, pardon. Uh, Victor, pardon. Uh, any more uh, questions? Like, and then Remy, if you want to. Oh, 
want to ask before that? Okay, let your uh, I, I mean this uh, phenomenon of uh, multiplying, so to speak, the number of uh, random uh, distributions W, random processes W, uh, especially from going from sine and cosine dependence into arbitrary uh, function, which is, uh, how do you call it, is it really on to pi. Uh, does it have anything to do that if you have a function periodic on to pi, you can expand it in a Fourier series? Yes. Because your equations look linear, right? We don't use Fourier expansion in the analysis. We use periodicity direct. Uh, now, uh, in uh, one of the extensions, when I want to deal with the color noise, mm -hmm. It's going to actually rely on the Fourier expansion. We didn't finish that. It's analytically much more involved. Uh, it really, it really was fun doing that, not being able to do it for several years. And I'll, I'll tell you the story later. But uh, there, uh, the cosine and sine is significantly simpler. And if you have an arbitrary uh, periodic function, you have to expand it in the Fourier. Do it uh, for your series, do it mode by mode, and then put the results together. It's going to be uh, analytically fine work that we haven't completed yet. Okay, more questions? Maybe on Zoom. Uh, I'll come to that. From the audience here? No. Uh, from online audience? No. All right, uh, then I have a question. I, I, I have a bit of a trouble uh, visualizing the uh, negative uh, C, so the advancement in time. How do you program that? I mean, delay is sort of easy. You have a physical system, it, it has a stimulus, and it takes some time until the, the physical system reacts to the stimulus. So what does the advancement mean? I mean, for example- This is what you're doing. No, 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 but, but how, how does it look like in practice? I mean, if I, if I have a robot, which is... That's say, how it looks in practice. The robot is following the... No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Let, let, me, let me finish. Please. So there is some electronics. In, there is a source of light, okay? So the sensor senses the light. And then it takes some time for electronics to process and give the signal to the actuators or servers to uh, rotate the, the robot. This is delay. This is how I understand delay. Or not, or this no. is not a delay. No, that's negligible. The delay is worked into the equations through. Well, I, uh, pardon, this. I, I, I mentioned electronics, so this is negligible because this is all milliseconds. But imagine yes. that you have a very slow electronics, or you have a pre-programmed delay. So you have a, a light sensor; mm -hmm. it processes the signal, and then let's say the actuators are slow, so your motors start rotating slowly, so if effectively you have a delay in the response to the motion. So that's delay. So how do you program the advancement then? Well, so you're talking about an honest way of looking at this system. Aha. But we do this system. Because maybe that's the secret that, that if, if, if you don't have a clear, uh, a clear physical interpretation of the C as some sort of a delay time, then maybe this minus two is some sort of an artifact. Well, it's not an artifact in the sense that if you follow, if you have explorers following these equations, you see the transition at minus two. Now, what you're asking now is, I think, the following. If I treat this delta seriously, and if I make delta negative so that I'm looking here at T plus something well, positive. Mean, no, 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 no. But I mean, the, the, the question is, in fact, the question is even for positive delta, is my approximation any sensible? Despite the fact that I'm studying the robots that follow these equations, so I'm doing an honest work. But uh, is this really close to that? That's a legitimate question. And we don't know because, as I pointed out, our uh, expansions had uh, correction terms that we didn't control. In fact, there are reasons to doubt it. And Tanner, for 
is, is an example of a person who thinks that this linearization is a little suspicious. This does not reflect upon the work that we did because we don't we work on this system, but it's a very interesting question whether uh, we have a faithful approximation uh, to that. For positive data or for negative data, it doesn't really matter, okay? Mm, well, let me rephrase it then. So you, uh, mm -hmm. when, when the engineers or the experimentalists are, like you said, programming the swarm of robots, uh, to what uh, physical or, or, or program parameter this C is related to? You know? So in other words, so... Yarko, we, we are looking, we, we are dealing with this exactly. well, system. This be some sort of uh, like a uh, recognition. Yeah, See, the future. Future. And and then, no, no, but I mean... There were a few steps when well, the, contact, the contact was lost. But we circumvent that problem because we are working on this system. So, so okay. So, so there's an, there is yes, no yes. counter. So his, his, his defense is quite reasonable. It's, it's as if they try to so the future. This on system on of equation approximates the, the system of the real system of equation. It's, it's, it's as if they try to predict the future using some kind of linearization. Yeah, of course. So yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Of course. Yeah. 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 And this is how the robots work, right? This is how there the robots is no work. But I'm also told, I didn't study this myself, but I'm also told that bacteria do something very similar to that. Okay. So this is model and it works well. Okay, I understand. But I, I should not treat this negative delay too seriously. It's, this is this system which, which, which governs. No. Um, That's what's any happening. more questions or comments? No, if not, then let's thank Yanek again for this. <laughs>